Well, here we go again. Thirsty again. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. I'm John Williams, owner and winemaker of Frog Sleep. And I'm Roy Williams, the true owner and winemaker of Frog Sleep. We're getting the variation we, on that. When are you getting a haircut, by the way? Look at this. <laughs> no, no, this is, this is the release the Kraken haircut. <laughs> hey, you guys. Happy Memorial Day weekend. Uh, I hope it's as beautiful as it is uh, where you are as it is here. It's going to be a uh, it's going to be a warm weekend. Nice warm weekend. It'll get nice and hot next week, and uh, it's summertime, baby. So, yeah. So what do the grapes think about this? Because we're uh, we're in bloom now, right? Yes. We, we are in bloom. But do, before we jump into that, we got you got the housekeeping. Oh, stuff you got to do the housekeeping. We stuff, get reminded yeah. of this, you know. I thought the housekeeping every stuff single was session. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> but okay, you know, okay. there is the first order of business with housekeeping. I was just gonna say, thirsty, and I'm excited. This is the new one. Is the new one, 2019 yeah. Sauvignon Blanc. So get a glass of this in front of you. Of the 2019. As always, uh, if you're connected to us via Zoom, please ask questions in the Q and A. Um, we will interpret your question to our advantage and then try to answer it uh, in our own halting fashion, as usual. As usual. Yeah. Um, all right. And uh, you can find the wines for this session and previous sessions and upcoming sessions, all the sessions, on interactive.frogsleep.com. Yeah. Um, but cheers. Cheers. 2019 Sauvignon Blanc. Yeah. Here's to you all on this beautiful weekend. I hope you're with family. We are with family. It's going to be fun. But yeah. we do have to give a little shout out. To my big, or uh, my big brother, yeah, 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 yeah. you're my, more mature. My smaller but smarter brother, Tyler. Uh, it's his birthday today. Um, he's been a little under the weather, so he wasn't able to make it up here today. Yeah. But uh, happy birthday, Kai! Happy Love, birthday, Kai! And Love to Annie, Annie. yeah, and yeah. to Annie. Um, wish you guys could be here, but uh, much love to you guys, and uh, hope you're having a good. Hope you're having a good weekend. Uh, but yeah, 2019 Sauvignon Blanc. Yeah. The uh, the 2020 Sauvignon Blanc is uh, uh, not yet mature. You know, you know we, we, we pick on the early side, but we don't pick in uh, in May. But little berries are starting to show up, right? You know, we're we're right in the middle of bloom, and in the earliest blocks of Sauvignon Blanc, I was walking through some of our earliest blocks to just this morning, and we are starting to get a little bit of set. So, yeah. Yeah. you know, uh, we'll get we can do a little quick dive on to, on viticulture on how grapes uh, how. How great oh, babies. you want to talk about viticulture again? <laughs> I am so shocked. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about how great babies are made. You know, oh, this yeah, is, uh, yeah. sorry, this, this is a family yeah, show. I know. I know. This is <laughs> 18, 18 plus here from here on out. Um, I guess it's technically 21 plus, but yeah, maybe there so. you go. Um, so grapes are, you know, berries. So they uh, they form from flowers, and uh, you don't often hear about grape flowers, but they are out there. They're really little tiny guys, um, and they have right now. If you walk through the vineyards you'll smell this very sweet nectar kind of floral scent and that's because we're in the middle of bloom. Now with a lot of things like our, our fruit trees on the property we rely on pollinators, the bumblebees, honeybees, uh, all sorts of insects to help pollinate um, and form the fruit. Grapes are a little bit different. Grapes have what are called perfect flowers, so male and female parts uh, we, for oh, those tell of you, me more about that. Yeah, we, 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 you know, for your sake, we won't go too far into that. You know. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I don't know how much we've avoided that discussion before. <laughs> <laughs> Not sure how much they taught you in climber, but you know. <laughs> oh, <come on. laughs> but, uh, but grapes actually self-pollinate. So we don't. All we're really relying upon uh, during bloom is just good weather. And so far, we've had some. You know, it's, the weather's always a little variable. This is pretty much perfect right now. We're in the 80s. Uh, it's nice and sunny. Um, when you get tons of rain or if you get very, very hot temperatures, there can sometimes be some problems. But generally speaking, we're, uh, we're starting to set varieties. Merlot's already going into set and uh, Cabernet's in bloom. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but this is also when the buds are starting to form, the premoral buds for the following year too. So it's doubly important this time of year. Exactly, so when you get sunshine on the growing shoots right now, those are forming the buds for next year's growth. The vine is already thinking about next year and it's forming how fruitful those buds are going to be next year. So good weather, it's kind of its kind of interesting. You can have really, really foul weather right now this time of year. Careful, Hal. And it, yeah, oh, Hal, watch, watch out for those steps. Okay. Um, <laughs> but you can have really poor weather right now, and even if it doesn't affect this year's crop, sometimes it'll have an effect upon next year's crop. So uh, you're kind of always on edge with uh, this time of year. It's oh, incre farmers. incredibly, to oh, you're, you know, my knee's acting up. I think it's gonna be a good bloom, you know. Hey, we're gonna have a fun show today, and uh, some of uh, our family, our family has joined us. Many of our family have joined us, and uh, they're they're uh, getting a little picnic started behind us. Uh, they're, we're gonna introduce uh, uh, various members of the family as the day goes along, yeah. and. Uh, 
But right now we're introducing the newest member of the family, the twenty uh, the twenty nineteen seven year block. This is its debut. This is uh, its debut. Yeah, yeah. the twenty nineteen really beautiful. Um, I think that I mean this is obviously quite young, but I think this wine got a little bit of extra time on the yeah. lees. Yeah. Um, this wine we bottled after about six months on the lees uh, this year. A little bit of skin contact at uh, right at the, right at crush. And I don't know, Dad. I'm really, I'm really stoked about this wine. This is really tasty. It's nice. fun. To, it's fun to try because we've been drinking a lot of the 18. We're just at the end of the 18. Uh, you know, because of all that's been going on, we're a little delayed in releasing the uh, 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 the uh, 19. Uh, but it's always fun when it comes out this time of year, and it's uh, so vivacious. And you know, um, we talk a lot of, uh, about wines, and you'll hear winemakers talking about uh, wines being reduced or uh, being reductive. Uh, or oxidized, and I, I think this is a perfect example because I've been drinking the 18, which is so now just really developed so beautifully. This wine is still, I need a little more to tell for sure. Yeah, yeah just to uh, double check. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's just uh, just starting to open its wings a little bit. Okay, so uh, so owner and winemaker of Frog's Leap, what the fact does reduction mean? <laughs> Okay, so here's an insider thing on uh, when winemakers talk about a wine being reduced. Basically, everything that's important in wine um, is a uh, is an organic compound, uh, meaning that it's based on carbon. So your everything from your ethanol to your uh, to your uh, esters, every there what several hundred ingredients uh, in small traces in wine, and uh, all carbon-based elements or organic uh, compounds. I have sites on them where uh, hydrogen ions can be attached and uh, over time those hydrogen ions will unattach and then oxygen ions will come in on the same place, right? And so this is the arc of wine is this idea because when you ferment a wine, it is basically 100% saturated with hydrogen ions, but slowly over time those ions will disassociate and oxygen ions will come into the place and this is the arc of wine. So a big part of the art of winemaking is understanding where a wine is on that curve of going from being tight and with the hydrogen ions on to slowly losing those hydrogen ions and opening up the oxygen. Of course, now, if at some point in the wine's life, too much of that can go on and then the, the, uh, too much oxygen will, will come out of those sites and then the wine tastes oxidized or more like sherry. And that that's, that's really what you get in a lot of older wines that are no longer fun. So very much the art of winemaking is uh, because when a wine is totally reduced and totally closed in, uh, it doesn't smell so great. This is in fact why we swirl the glass, particularly on young wines like this, is to just let a little bit more of that oxygen in to start to change and release those compounds. I think that, I mean, so that's a pretty deep dive for everybody and try to, you know, <laughs> def right. definitely yeah. catch up on it later because it's, it's, it's worth going over. I think some important points there are that wine has several hundred aroma compounds. With a few exceptions, there, we cannot, as winemakers, directly change a single aroma in a wine. There are exceptions to that. But in general, our job as a winemaker is to control the environment in which all of these aromas are kind of floating around. And you can do that by limiting or promoting access to oxygen interacting with that kind of the, the liquid matrix of the wine and if you when you change small amounts of oxygen getting into the into a wine will change all of the chemicals all at once all of the all of the aroma flavors uh, all at once in subtle ways and so it's our it's kind of the art of winemaking is figuring out how much is appropriate if you don't you said like if you don't allow any oxygen in there at all right then the wine will tend to taste will stay reduced. too reduced, and it will be very tight and not allow a lot, of, not not be very expressive, not be very developed. Obviously, if it's got too much oxygen, it just tastes oxidized. And that finding where that balance is, you know, for us, our t our tastes lean towards when a wine is young, having it be just a little bit tighter, so that you can get it into your glass, and that's why you know, swirling like this is gonna add a lot of oxygen really, really quickly. This is almost like a, a rapid fire decanter in a way. Yeah, yeah. And that's what's gonna allow the wine to develop in the glass, which is why we love pouring really big pours of wine into our glasses and then <laughs> drinking them over long periods of time. Well, and, and, and why we're learning a little bit, because notice that this is our first Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, I, no, this is the second Sauvignon Blanc with a screw cap. And uh, we had to learn a little bit because that changes the dynamic 
of the amount of oxygen that gets uh, incorporated into the wine when you bottle it, basically. Yeah. So. I, the, the purpose of the screw cap, um, you know, and th there is a question on here on why, why a screw cap on the Sauv Blanc. We actually do have it on the Rosé as well, which we'll open up in a moment. It's that we found that Sauvignon Blanc, um, and there's another question on here, where, where is this on the arc? This is, this is on the reductive side of the arc right now. This is on a fairly tight, especially since it was just recently bottled, it's fairly new to the bottle. We want it, we want it to be a little if bit- If this were a flower, it would be just showing the first pink of the tulip. Exactly. Basically. When yeah. you buy flowers for somebody, you don't buy flowers that are just in full well, bloom I and do. start to fall and apart. And then I get hollered at, yeah, we'll yeah, talk about that later. Yeah. You buy them when they're just starting to bud out so that they bloom for a long time. That's, that's kind of the analogy with that. Um, but wines like Sauvignon Blanc, wines like our Rosé, tend to be very, very sensitive to where they're at on that curve. The screw cap gives us, um, A, a little bit more control over that arc. It allows us to really precisely control how much oxygen is getting into this wine, and it eliminates pork taint. Um, yeah. And it makes it easy to open. It's, uh, you know, it's Memorial Day weekend. We hope that you guys are picnicking with your families, with your loved ones. Or even just by yourself with a bottle of frog sleep and you know the screw cap. It's, it's, it's pretty, pretty nice. nice. <laughs> <laughs> we were a little skeptical at it first. It doesn't tip over lie. the picnic basket. I'm not going to sure. lie. It was yeah. a little skeptical at first. Yeah. It is interesting. You know, there's a good question on here. And how is flowering different by varietal? Um, it, typically, the varieties yeah. that we prune first and that bud out in the spring first will go into bloom first. And those are the varieties that, with some exceptions, will tend to ripen first. So Cabernet is, uh, is typically the last to go into bloom. It's the last to pick. It's the last one. But it's pretty prune. well in bloom too, right yeah, now. They're, they're, yeah, they're, the, the difference is, is in terms of single digit days. It's not a, a week's difference. It's not as great a difference as you see during harvest where we'll pick Sauvignon Blanc in the middle of August and we'll pick Cabernet in the middle of October. Um, it's not quite that dramatic. Um, but that's kind of, it, it bounces all over the place. It varies a lot depending on soil type as well. The well-drained, really warm soils, those will go out and they'll start kicking out flowers right away. Some of the colder soils, the deep clay soils, will tend to limit that a little bit. So it's not a, it's not a, a set curve or anything like that. And sometimes you'll just get totally surprised and go, oh crap, you know, Great North is out, is out early this year. Um, and, uh, but bloom is very important because a lot of rain or cold weather would be more problematic or in very hot weather. So you really don't yeah. want it to be too hot during bloom. Bloom is very, very important in terms of the vine development as well because this went, you can almost, uh, you can almost predict the start of harvest um, based on the start of bloom because bloom is really when the vine is finally casting all its chips on the table and saying, okay, it's time to roll. It's time for me to start developing fruit. And from that point, it's not on a, on a immovable clock, but it's, uh, you know, it's not going to deviate significantly. Whereas bud break and things earlier in the year, the vine will intentionally delay coming, uh, starting to bud out in the spring based on how hot or based on how cold it is. But once it's gone into bloom and once it starts to set its fruit, it's it's on a path that, uh, you know, you can often predict the start of harvest within just a few days um, based on that. So yeah. we're on track for a pretty normal harvest this year, middle of August, that's some, sometime around there. Yeah. Um, but, you know, cool. but it's exciting. It is. It's fun to try the wine. Yeah. Speaking of new releases, you got anything that's about four months old? Wow, I'm trying to think. I'm trying to think. Molly? <laughs> <laughs> Come on over, Ma. Okay. Here, you sit in the middle. <laughs> so I thought our cue was our, you know, the newest member of the family, but it turns out it was a Sauvignon Blanc. <laughs> <laughs> so for those of you who don't know, this is my wife, Molly. Um, and this is our newborn daughter, Alma. Hi, Alma. <laughs> is this really her first television appearance? It is her first television, although it's not her first screen time appearance. She's, we've been doing a, she's already a FaceTime pro at this point, so. Uh, Rory, uh, could you be polite? Yes, I, I was waiting for you to bring the glass. Some, you know, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, my wife, uh, Molly and I, we met uh, many, many years ago at this point. 13 years ago? 13 years ago. Um, so we've been together for a long time, but this is our first little daughter, Alma. And she's, uh, Kind of showing some Memorial Day vibes by Yeah, she's, she's, rocking. <laughs> she's rocking it. She, she's ready for picnicking and, and relaxing for sure. Um, but I'm really, uh, Molly, do you want to talk a little bit about um, how you're involved with the industry here? Sure. I work for an organization called Napa Valley Grape Growers, and 
the heart and soul of what we do is agricultural preservation. And so I think it's you know, always important to remember that wine is an agricultural product and that's part of the ethos of Frog's Leap. Uh, agricultural preservation and farming with care. Um, yeah, it's really rewarding. It, I think across the country, there's something like 40 acres of farmland that's lost every hour. So it's a huge yeah. swath of farmland that really, based on development, you could never get back. But here in Napa, we haven't lost a single acre of our ag zoned land so, since 1968, which is a pretty big deal. It's a, it's a model model program. Yeah. yeah, it's why when you come up here to visit us here at Frogsip, it's why you see vineyards, it's why you see agricultural land around you, is because of the ag preserve and Molly works extremely hard to help protect that. Um, Frog's Leap has been involved with the Napa Valley Grape Growers, Molly's organization for a very long time. My mentor in the vineyards, Frank Leeds, is a past president of the Grape Growers uh, and really helped establish it early on. And so it's, uh, it's uh, an organization uh, connected with the Far Napa Valley Farm Worker Foundation as well um, that does a ton of work uh, for educational outreach and uh, safety, and protocols. safety protocols, training, career development for farm workers here in the valley. Um, it's uh, probably my favorite organization, <laughs> one of my favorite organizations in the Valley. And, and not just because your wife works there. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> it's part of why it's, I'm so ecstatic is she, works, that she works there. It's just uh, an incredibly awesome and progressive and, and uh, just amazing organization. I think so. it's appropriate to uh, toast also to some of our agricultural essential workers because they've been working for the past 10 weeks yeah. Um, yeah. all across the food chain and to produce this wonderful wine. So totally. cheers to totally. uh, cheers, yeah. farmers and farm workers. I spilled my. Oh well. Yeah, that's are all you right. down again? No, it's okay. So I we are I'm almost waiting for bottom. the rosé. Yeah. Okay. But yeah. So, so, but we're excited for Alma to get on the tractor for the first time. It's a couple <laughs> weeks away, but she'll uh, have to wake up first. Yeah. I mean, the thing about heavy machinery, Alma, is you have to be awake when you're operating it. So, uh, <laughs> but she is only she is only four months old, so I guess we'll give her a break uh, yeah. for right now. Yeah. Um, but we'll get we'll get her out there soon. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. She was practicing saying 100 points, and I think it knocked her out. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you say 100 points so often, what you have yeah, to do you, with Frogs and You only taste 100 point wines on yeah, this show. Yeah. Uh, it yeah. gets really tiring. Well, yeah. thanks for getting Rory up on these Saturday afternoons for the last uh, 10 weeks. It's been uh, nice, and uh, yeah. Yeah, thanks and, for tuning uh, in. Yeah. Great. Awesome. Thanks, Mo Molly, and thank you, Alma. Thank you, you did Alma. great. Yeah. You did a great job. <laughs> I'm not sure if I'm doing as good of a job holding you. <laughs> You're going to be judged. Yeah, it makes this get easier. Sometime after four months, I guess. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thanks, Mom. Yeah. yeah. Don't eat all the cheese. Yeah. <laughs> well, we told you it's going to be a family show. We got more more of that coming, you guys. But anyway, I want to I want to get to the rosé. But I'm really excited about the Sauvignon Blanc, and I hope you guys are too. I'm, I know some of you probably still have the 18, which is just drinking so wonderfully right now. Uh, but it is it is there that it's in full flower, whereas this is still just a bud. It's really kind of cool. Um, Sorry, it's bad manners to pour yourself. First. Yes, is it really? Yeah. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I'm supposed to pour for you now. This is the Japanese. Yeah. Yeah. Were you really going to spend time yeah. on this? Yeah. I guess so. Yeah. <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> you sad to see that coming. <laughs> it is a tradition to short pour people in this family yeah. as well. So. so now this is the new rosé as well, right? The brand new rosé. Yeah. Bendicino Appalachian. So this, uh, the rosé, you know, for many years we made the rosé as uh, simply coming out of our Rossi vineyard, out of a small block of Napa Gamay or Valdegay vines yeah. uh, planted over 70 years ago. And it was always a, just kind of a fun thing we kind of tacked on. It's a very, very small block of vines. Um, we would typically only get a couple hundred cases of it. And, uh, and drink 50 ourselves. And drink 50 <laughs> ourselves, and it was quickly, uh, quickly out of it. Um, but, you know, this was, uh, I think 2015 was the first year where we wanted to make a little bit more rosé. Um, but we knew, you know, the kind of there's a typical way of making rosé out there where you'll actually make it as a byproduct of red wine making. So you'll you'll bring your Cabernet in at full ripeness, at full red wine ripeness, so somewhere between 13 and half and 14 percent potential alcohol. And you'll bring those grapes in, you'll crush them, and you'll bleed off some of the juice. So the you'll son, sonye. The sonye, which is French for bl for blood or bleeding. Um, and so you'll bleed off some of that juice and you'll put it off to the side and then you'll have more skins, uh, uh, higher skins to uh, um, 
to liquid ratio in your red wine. And that's, uh, that's what you want because it gets you extra extraction. We don't do that because we feel like it throws often throws off the ba the extraction balance in the wine. But then what to do with what's bled off, and that's the uh, sun. Make, you it quit, make it cheap buck. What do yeah, you mean? Right. You know, what and do we do it, with it? Yeah. I think we've all seen a proliferation of rosés out there, and you really want to, in our opinion, draw the dis distinction between these Saunier rosés, which often can be higher in alcohol and, and body and so on, and they're, they're fine. Uh, but to me, the beauty of rosé is this beautiful white freshness, uh, the summertime picnic sort of feel. And that's an intentional rosé, where we actually pick the grapes and harvest them, crush them with the intent from the very beginning of making rosé. So this only spends an hour at the best on its skins. It, it really I gets mean, it. Very, very little time. I mean, basically we can't get it off the skins fast that's enough correct, because yeah. it picks up color so quickly. And you know, Dad, I think it's important to point out that um, we go even a little bit beyond that, where not only do we purpose pick these, ros these grapes for rosé, we actually contract with a vineyard a single vineyard for the rosé, specifically for the rosé and only for the rosé. And that's in the Rossetti Vineyard up in Mendocino. So this is actually the only wine that Frog Sleep makes that is not a Napa Valley wine. This is a Mendocino Appalachian wine. Um, you should see this vineyard though, and the Rossetti family, they're so beautiful. These vines were, some of them were planted as early as... 1939 is there, are the earliest grapes that we get off of this uh, ranch. It's currently farmed by, the, by uh, Tom and Pam Rossetti, and Tom's father planted the grapes and they've been farming them continuously for 70 years plus. It's a gor absolutely gorgeous vineyard. And it, we're... It's, uh, it's really incredible to, it, for me, it's, it's, it's an incredibly rewarding experience to go up to, this is, Men this is an area of Mendocino, uh, inland Mendocino County, so not the coast. It's not an off-traveled, it's just north of the town of Ukiah, if, if anybody has been up there before. Um, it's a beautiful but hot and fairly uh, uh, untouristed area of California, but Man, you just you walk up there, you walk ten feet, and you, you stumble over a seventy-year-old vine. It's pretty crazy. Yeah, um, it's it's an, an absolute viticultural treasure of California, and uh, the Rossettis farm this vineyard organically, and they dry farm it as well. And those were two really key things. I was actually going up there uh, to check on some other grapes uh, for another project, and I kept driving by this vineyard, and just every time it was kind of this, you know, turn your head and look at the vineyard, like man, that's a nice looking vineyard. And finally, uh, worked up the just worked up the gumption and knocked on the door, left a card, said, "I'd love to, we'd love to buy some of your grapes." And we've been working with the Rossetti since 2015 yeah. uh, every year just to make this rosé for you guys, which we love because it's we you know we talk about a Provençal style rosé, which is sometimes you know Pro Provence is the is a beautiful source of rosés. It's the home of the classic you know Bandols and Tavel rosés that we just love that are so delicious. Um, I think sometimes it can get a bad rap because Provencal rosé can also be just a little bit like uh, cheap, you know, castaway rosé. Yeah, sure, sure. When it when it's when it's not made when it's not made correctly, for us the rosé with the intention with the rosé is to make a fully flavored, a very intense rosé that is nonetheless high in acid. It's low in alcohol. Yeah, it's something uh, you twelve point two on this wine, which is one of the higher we made. Usually these are down even at eleven nine. Eleven they, they, eight would be un, not but right around twelve percent is the target, and and really it's the acid in Carignan, which is the the primary grape in this, is a great grape for rosé because it holds on to its acidity very late into the season, so you can get great flavors while getting lower alcohols and higher acidity. You know wine. who I think would like to have, come up and have a glass of this with us? Who? Maybe someone I know in my life. Yeah. Hey, Tori, come on and have a glass of rosé with us. <laughs> We're on the rosé here, come on. <laughs> so to, Royal to qu quickly ask the, answer the question, what grape varieties are in the rosé? So I think it's about 90 plus percent Carignan, and the rest is still some of that Val de Gay from Rossi. Uh, so it's, uh, but mostly it's a varietal Carignan, we just don't put Carignan on the label. Can I pour you a little rosé, dear? Thank you. That would be I think a lot of you have met Tori, but this is my wife, Tori. <laughs> and, whoops, did you lose your hat? I did, but it's okay. It's going to be okay. Sun, yeah. So it's okay. There we go. Good. Thanks for joining us. Cheers. Yeah. Thank you. So, she's pretty awesome, you guys. Yeah, pretty awesome. Tori's going to be helping us, too. I don't know, uh, uh, many of you uh, know that we uh, grow so many other crops besides grapes here. Uh, peaches, pears, figs, apples, cherries. I, you know, I, I have my little lineup of things. Yes, and, uh, do. Uh, uh, Jeremy, our farm manager, uh, decided to start a family and then get married. And so he's moved out of the area. <laughs> and uh, Tori this year has stepped into the region and is helping us a little bit with all the farm products that so many of you love and so on. So 
What's what's on deck with that? What's exciting? Well, I think what's really exciting is that there's so much opportunity. We have to grow these things because it's part of our farming practice to have variation in and diversity and biodiversity in the in the general sea of grapevines. And so um, it's kind of fun to see these things come on. I mean, the orchard of peaches that was planted at our houses is now really ready for action and producing a lot of fruit yeah. and um, we have really healthy hives and so there's just so much going on and, and so many ways to utilize that and make opportunity out now of it. i know what your favorite fruit is of all of them though do you yeah <laughs> take, take a guess then. <laughs> <laughs> well grapes of course yeah, <laughs> yeah, right, 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 right. <laughs> she's responsible for half the consumption uh, of yeah, our <laughs> Uh, I am partial to the sour cherries. We yeah, have, the tart cherries. We have yeah. one tree that John planted um, on the property really early on in our relationship, and so it's really fun to have a few sour cherries to play with, and um, those are coming on pretty soon. She can bake a cherry pie, I'm just telling you that right so, now. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, we make yeah. different things and try to extend the, the life of the crops and also use what we have in a productive way, and so it's kind of fun to constantly be trying to figure out how to marry those things together. and. Um, you know, complement yeah. the wine. So. And, and I, I think Tori hit on something that is pretty key to all this, which is just, it's fun. It's, uh, I mean, it's, you know, I guess we make, do we make some money off of it? I'm not sure if we actually do or not. Eh, probably not. Yeah, we, 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 we. <laughs> <laughs> but it is, it is extremely fun. It's part of, you know, we're in this, uh, this rich agricultural valley. Uh, it's really great you know, in addition to being a great place for Cabernet Sauvignon and Sauvignon Blanc, it's Everything actually grows just there. about every, I mean, we haven't yeah. tried coconuts, but I suppose we could, we could, uh, we could go there too someday. Um, you know, it's really just really fun to have the hot sauce and the olive oil and all of the farm products that we make, um, you know, increase our enjoyment of, of the land and increase our enjoyment of the wine. And well, and many of you are frog fellows, and you, uh, yeah, I think, so appreciate that, your little uh, goodies uh, that come in your uh, in your shipments, right? And there's always product that's available depending on what we've made. But I think it's important that it isn't just a fun little side project; that it really oh. actually is a big part of our farming plan to have this biodiversity yep. in the landscape. And so, rather than just have it be ornamental, mm -hmm. um, which is also important for pollinators, it's it's also productive. And so, um, we can feed some people with it, and we can make some beautiful things and preserve the harvest and extend it, but it also does serve a really important purpose. And that's and that's a meaningful thing for us. Yeah, well, and, and we, we failed to even mention the fact that having the other crops does help us fill out the calendar for labor and so that all yep. of our uh, uh, field workers can be employed year round because yep. and, and that might not be possible if we didn't have a more diversified agricultural program. After after grape harvest uh, comes olive harvest. After olive harvest comes olive pruning. Uh, after olive pruning comes fruit tree pruning. After fruit tree pruning comes Citrus. grape, grape pruning. pruning. <laughs> and then the whole thing starts over again. And it's uh, having that kind of balanced farm. Um, in addition to making it fun, makes it a balanced system. Allows us to yeah. not just say you know not just be a monoculture and I think that that's central to principle we've talked about with organic farming and, and just good farming is having a balance of crops and having a, uh, even though Napa is you know and rightfully so very famous for grapes um, and, and we are a winery we make wine uh, yeah. splash, but it's uh, <laughs> but I think I think Tori hit it down on the nail which is that it's an extremely important important part of who we are um, and you know why we do things the way we do we, otherwise why would we commit three acres to uh, to fruit trees and vegetables and all these things. But I think too, Marie, like when people can come and visit again and, and um, I mean, I've been in the garden when people show their children with, with great mystery and wonder, you know, where their food comes from. And yeah. so we're really lucky we live someplace where we can walk out to the chicken coop or we can pick an apple on our way um, to pick up the mail, but a lot of people don't. So it's, it's a way for us to help reconnect people to their food source. That's why we had to put those little and, uh, tents over the strawberries. So they yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we never have strawberries available because yeah. you guys keep eating them whenever you come yeah. here. Yeah. So that's okay. That's okay. Which that's is okay. how a strawberry patch should be, yeah, right? It's instant yeah. gratification. It reminds me of actually small the, the, way I, uh, the way I was able to convince my wife to move to California was to Strawberry. take her in, and uh, it was actually pe a peach straight off of the tree. Yeah. It's kind of like, oh man, I've got that. Took her straight to the best peach tree we have in the garden. Hey, speaking of peaches, we're, we're not at all certain we're going to be able to have the peach festival this year because uh, of, of the restrictions on group gatherings and so on. Uh, stay tuned, but right now it doesn't look good. Uh, 
Uh, we'll, we'll, uh, uh, it, it's going to be sad because that's become such a great tradition, and I'm sure many of you have been here for that. Uh, but, but we've uh, got some ideas up our sleeves. Yeah, we'll, well. Yeah. we might, uh, we what might a virtual have virtual peach festival. Oh, I think we might have a virtual peach, fe peach festival. All so right. ideas yeah. are in the works. Don't yeah. check out interactive.frogsleep.com yeah. for all the details. Yeah, um, but we'll, don't worry. Uh, Frogsleep knows how to party, whether it's in person or over over the internet, I guess. Yeah, well, I'm really excited to see uh, you've got some recipes up your sleeve, some new ideas on uh, farm products. You're working with Deg and then Chewy and Monaco and Jessica, and uh, I see you uh, plotting behind the scenes. So uh, we're excited to see what goes on with uh, all the farm products. Well, we're so. glad people enjoy what we send, and we hope that um, they'll continue to be interested in that, yeah, cultivate absolutely. an interest in food and wine. Yeah. Cheers to yeah, that. Absolutely. All right. Do you want to introduce your little baby boy, or uh, do we want to do that later on? Hey, Owen. Hey, Owen. Come on over. <laughs> so you guys have to know, Owen was three when I met him. Uh, and he Hi, is, everyone. He, he was actually more, no, you're, you're, Owen spent the week bottling uh, Merlot, right? So we finished the Merlot this week. We did finish up Merlot this week on Friday. Yeah. 18 Merlot, freshly bottled and uh, freshly Friday. stacked, thanks to the muscle man here. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. You got all those this week. <laughs> <laughs> Would you say it, it, the bottling line's running at half time so we can have adequate distance between yeah. people? So That's it was right. actually a yeah. really pleasant bottling experience. That's <laughs> true. That's Not true. like the half I love speed, Lucy version. Great. <laughs> <laughs> Very well, true. you know what they say, there are few, few pleasures so great as bottling wine. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Did, yeah. I, nobody says that. <laughs> <laughs> nobody who bottles wine says that. <laughs> Bottling may be the least favorite task, I would say. Uh, so we stick it with, uh, oh, we got stuff for that. <laughs> right. Yeah. Everybody yeah. gets Every their year, bottling yeah. line yeah. initiation. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Exactly. So there you go. So. Well, awesome, you guys. Well, I know um, Hal is very eager to. Yeah, and, and we've got to get some Zinfandel open, and we're going to get right. Hal up here. So thank you guys for joining us. Right. Don't, uh, we're going to have a little picnic here in a second. Yeah, yep. of course. Right. Yep. <laughs> Thanks, Sudi. So a few of you have been asking about the, uh, the label on the rosé. What is the story on the label yeah. of the rosé, Dad? Because it is a different label. You know, part of the reason is that it, uh, you know, it's the rosé just started off as something fun. Nowadays, we, we keep it different because it is our only non-Napa Valley wine, so we feel like that's kind of appropriate, but also because it's, it started out as kind of a silly idea. What, is, what does La Grande Rouge <laughs> Jante even mean? Uh, it doesn't mean anything, as it turns out. <laughs> because it's <laughs> actually grammatically incorrect. In, uh, in true Frogsley fabulous fashion, we got the French wrong. Uh, but we've had to keep it, because you can't, you know. Yeah, well, uh, the first year we Never made, admit uh, a mistake. Uh, never admit a mistake, <laughs> but uh, we love this uh, little label. And uh, uh, it, it, there are many, many details on it uh, You can uh, uh, that, that where we tried to... Uh, really riffed on what it would look like if this were a, a, a rosé made in the south of France because we really wanted to convey that idea that that was our intention of making an intentional uh, rosé and so the label is just packed full of puns and fun and yeah. uh, so, and, so you'll and, notice uh, if you have the bottle in front of you the Appalachian Mendocino or Appalachian California Controlé that's a take on the French AOC system, the Appalachian de Origine Controlé. Yeah. Of course, there are no Appal Appalachian de Origine Controlés in California. We have geographic distinctions, but uh, that's a that's a fun way of just kind of playing off of that. Got I, this, I, I honestly don't, can't believe we got this label approved. I, I, I don't know who you bribed at the TTB <laughs> to get this label. You bribed the government. <laughs> <laughs> what do you say? <laughs> right, right. No, you. Can, yeah, if you anybody's know. listening, oh, you no, can, definitely yeah, can't bribe the government. Oh, no, not at all. Uh, definitely not. The reason for it being different is because why not? It's it's just kind of fun and. Well, uh, we didn't really think of it as being when we first started as being part of the uh, Frogsley family. Mm -hmm. right? It was yep. going to be a one-off, and then it was a two-off, and now it's a what? And now, a, and now we like, just keep doing we're it. We're working on the twenty-off. Yeah. And now, <laughs> now we're in the halfway through this bottle already. Yeah, yeah, so that's fair enough. You know, yeah, keep going with it. That happens. Yeah. Uh, what, Rory? What is the biggest secret you've kept from your dad? Uh, that would be the secret holding companies that actually control uh, <laughs> control it, the majority interest in the wineries. Uh, sorry, I'll, be, I'll get to you about that that's later. That's fine. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. As long as it's offshore, and I can go there. Yeah. What tips do you have to continue to refine your palate for wine tasting? I'll give you a, a, an action an action shot. Yeah. Actually, I don't Taste think, wine. I don't think, it, I don't it, think it was an action. I don't think it was a very accurate action shot because you didn't smell. Don't drink wine. Taste wine. I think that's it. Just spend that extra second. That's all it takes to let it flow over you. Register that thought. Cement it in your memory. Attach and a word to it. Attach well, a word to it. It doesn't have to be the. You don't have to think about it being the right word or the there correct are no word right or the words. traditional word. Just any word. 
goes the way that the way that humans experience aromas and the way that we it, you know we don't usually it's not natural for us to think oh this is uh strawberries and and cherries and is it sour cherries or bing cherries you know we're not set up as humans to do that kind of thing so you really have to use our big advantage as humans which is language to attach some kind of word which means some kind of memory to an aroma and that's what's going to etch it into your mind you're not going to remember the aromas themselves you're going to remember the words that you attach to that aroma yeah they don't have to be the right word start and making your own memory ladder yeah, yeah exactly yeah. and it helps to taste with other people because sometimes somebody else will find a word and it'll it, it's like it, it's like it was just right there in front of you that's what i was tasting you know oh it was well, this, and other times you'll go that's not i don't i don't get that I at don't all get and don't feel all. bad if you don't get that yeah at all. exactly yeah. and yeah. It, it, and i would don't uh don't fo focus over much on the on the you know the long poems of tasty notes that are written by critics um those are you know useful to the few i guess um but they you know sometimes those can be useful just for looking for words to attach to wine but just re you know read about wine um read the back read the back labels that uh yeah. I actually don't read the back labels. I, I write all the back labels, and, and so it's no. A, we do a pretty good job. Oh, we actually. do. Yeah, we do a fabulous job. We do. We got hundred points. On hundred points on the back label. I remember when uh, Kelly was five years old, and we were having our tasting group, and she walked by the table, and she grabbed the bottle and turned it five years old and looked at it and said, "Oh, that's a nice Chardonnay," and walked off. You know, so that was a segue, by the way. Yeah. Can we get your sister up here? Kelly. Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> but we're gonna need to. We're, gonna we're need telling to. a story on you. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, she's bringing her own wine too. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Come on up. <laughs> Hi, everyone. This is my daughter Kelly, who's an amazing, amazing, amazing woman, and we're gonna eat the rest of her family in just a second. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for coming on. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Guys. How's the picnic going back there? Yeah. Um, we're doing going well. We're reading about, we have a frog book. Uh, well, Kelly will introduce you soon to Hal, yeah. uh, who is just now uh, one Fif year and... He's 15 months 15 old. months old, yeah. 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 Months. And just started walking like two weeks ago. Hey, he likes at the beginning of quarantine, or so shelter in place, he's like, this is what I'm going to start walking. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect time. Perfect time. So yeah. I'll say, you know, it's been like, we've been like a six bottle household on pretty much daily. It's, been, it's a family it's tradition. Good. Yeah, speaking of models, can yeah. we uh, try a little bit of Zin with you yeah, here? Yeah, little, yeah. Little yeah. Uh, this is the 17 Zinfandel, and uh, so tell us, uh, will you tell everyone a little bit about what you do, and then we want to hear about this uh, this thing we're doing because yeah. you're, uh, you know, uh, tell us tell us what we're going to be doing in the next yeah. uh, month of June. Yeah. Well, yeah. So I'm a little bit of the black sheep of the family. I'm an attorney. <laughs> yeah. Um, Thank goodness. <laughs> I went to law school thinking like, oh, I can keep my brother and my dad out of trouble, but you know, they've that definitely hasn't, that kept hasn't me at an arm's <laughs> definitely kept me at an arm's length ever since. <laughs> Um, but my real passion is um, working with one of our um, really great nonprofits here in, in Napa um, called Puertas Abiertas Community Resource Center. Um, Say that slowly. Puertas Abiertas Open Doors Community yeah. Resource Center. Got it. Okay. Um, which is it's a family resource center uh, here in Napa um, that primarily serves the Latino community. Um, but I've been on the board for almost six years now. Wow. And um, yeah, it's, it's become, it's always been a really important organization to me. But you know, ever since having HAL, you know, the idea that every family in Napa has the opportunity to access all the amazing um, abundance of food that we have here, the, um, the really healthy lifestyle, um, the many social services, uh, this has become really super important to me. So I was really excited when you guys said that we might be able to uh, give back a little bit yeah. um, during this yeah. pretty crazy time because um, you know there are so many families that um, aren't lucky enough to be connected to Frog's Leap. I'm so proud that uh, the two of you guys have been able to keep everyone here at Frog's Leap employed and, and, and weather this storm. It's been um, a real source of pride. For me. It and partly I know came for out you. of your inheritance, so don't worry about <laughs> yeah. it. Hey, hey, wait, um, we have an inheritance? Yeah, well, hey, you used to. Oh. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, but as we know, this is a hospitality-driven community. There's 
so many hotels and restaurants and, and yeah. wineries. Not, that just, not just wineries yeah. here in Napa. It's been a, it's been a huge... Yeah, don't take my wine. <laughs> Sorry, it's a natural <laughs> reason. Get your hand slap. <laughs> so tell us specifically what we're going to yeah, be doing so, in a month or two. Get to the point. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Sorry. She was thirsty. Yeah, she was thirsty. Come on. Hey, you made the, They're you guys, drinking back there, too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you guys have made this really easy for everybody. Um, essentially, all you have to do is log when you're... You know, when you go back and uh, restock up on your picnic wines um, or any frog's leaf wine. Um, in the month of June. In the month of June, but starting right now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> if you guys want to log on today, that's yeah. great. Um, we will donate 15% of proceeds. Of the proceeds of that of, sale. Of that sale. Um, Who agreed to this? I think of Jessica. <laughs> <laughs> I'll throw Jessica in the yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um <laughs> we'll go back to Puertas Abiertas to help them meet the, the really unprecedented need at, at this time. So, so what does that look like? Yeah, I know you hate when I get emotional. I know, I know. So something to point out, yeah. just make sure when you're, uh, you can go to frogsleep.com, you can buy the wines, make sure you enter the promo code Puertas. And it'll prompt you, correct? It'll, 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 there's an easy way to enter. Uh, it'll prompt you for the promo code right as you're checking out. Uh, be sure to enter the promo code. Doesn't cost you anything. Doesn't cost you anything. But we will then know that you intended to, uh, for us to uh, donate that money. Yeah. And uh, P U E R T A S. Puertas. Yeah. 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 Um, and you know I can't stop. And there's a lot of other great wineries participating yes, yes. in this program. No, there are two other great wineries. Uh, two other great wineries. <laughs> but, um, Show them off, okay? That's yeah, okay. So Who I are just, they? Yeah. I, you know, and well, you guys, you, we I, just I want, kept yeah. drinking yeah. some wine. We yeah, have yeah, a, a yeah. beautiful. Um, a, a Napa Albarino, which is really unique. Um, what do we say? 25 acres? 20, 25 acres of Albarino. Of Albarino planted in the Achea. Um, so this is a, a project from uh, Luisa Bonachea and Ryan Pass, who are the winemaker at Ferrella. Winemaker um, Ferrella and uh, cl close friends of Kelly and I and, Mo and Molly and I. So. Yeah, so beautiful. So if they order this wine, so... Uh, it, it, they have to go on to Achea Wines. Okay, um, spell website. Achea. I'm not, yeah. it's up, I'm not sure it's up on the screen yeah, here. So. Yeah. We'll put there. it up here. Yeah. We'll get it up there. Yeah. -E -A. Alberino, Alberino from uh, Napa, which is really Okay, look, I want to try this. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm not drinking that, but we'll yeah, yeah. Going. Hey, you Go ahead. Yeah. Have we yeah. talked about the Zinfandel yet? Well, you just threw it away. <laughs> yeah. We'll get to the Zinfandel. Okay, we'll get to the Zinfandel. We have plenty yeah. of time. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. Uh, so no, that's another one. So Alberino, this, one is one. A, this is a, a great grown primarily in uh, in, uh, in Spain and Portugal, isn't it? In Galicia, yeah. In Galicia, yeah. yeah in Galicia yeah. and Spain. That's in Spain and Portugal, isn't it? Galicia. Yes, it is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and as, an, as a matter of fact, Achea means um, home or house in in the okay. Basque language. So if you yeah. if you pick up a few bottles of Achea, which we recommend, because this is a beautiful wine, it's yeah. delicious. And enter the Puertas Corte. Would you say a hundred points or? No, yeah. oh, no, yeah. I don't yeah. Come on, you can't far. give it. Yeah, yeah. I would. Yeah, maybe, maybe 96. <laughs> Fine, so. we'll, give, we'll, we'll yeah. give it a courtesy 100 points. Yeah. 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 I'm pretty sure wine enthusiasts gave it about 96. Oh, stop. Oh, come on. <laughs> we, we don't talk about actual <laughs> wine critics. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> We're the only wine critics. Yeah, we don't talk about wine criticizers. Yeah. yeah. Um, and but what's beautiful this? Beautiful wine, and then another wine that, um, you know, another winery that's participating is Trace Sabores. You know, this is a family day. Yeah, it is indeed. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so. Uh, Rory and I's mom, uh, Rory Kelly and I's mom, uh, Julie Johnson, makes this really fun red blend. I thought I would share well, I'm that not too. My red blend. I'll try to know. What? Who taught you how to pour wine? By the way? Well, I don't know where he says you know. Just try a little bit of everything. Yeah. yeah. So, right. so Trace Sabora's Winery is uh, uh, our mom's uh, property up on the Rutherford bench, uh, making the state Zinfandel and Cabernet, but also her really fun Porque No blend. Uh, so Trace Sabores is also doing the, the promotion with Puertas Abiertas, and so I very much encourage you to buy these wines. Uh, I was uh, on the tractor at Trace Sabores yesterday, so you know the family wears many different hats here, and so um, we get to we get to participate. And this is uh, uh, partially from the ranch that Kelly and I grew up on. Um, so let's so let's uh, let's a drum roll and bring in uh, Hal here because he, oh, yeah. he he's going to be uh, selling. He, he'll, yeah, yeah. he'll he'll sell this right. And, and and maybe Jeff, we'll bring in Jeff too. So, uh, <laughs> hey Hal, come on down, buddy. <laughs> so this is Hal, and this is Jeff. Join us, you guys. Yeah, uh, Hal's my first grandchild, and Jeff is my uh, first son-in-law. Yeah, and only, only son-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> 
I want to make sure I got that. <laughs> hey, buddy. We're can still you, working. Can you wave to everyone out there? Can, can you wave to the camera? Now? Say hi. Hello. There you go. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> you got the, you got the yeah. Prince wave here. Yeah. Yeah. You blew him a kiss, too. Oh, Almasita say what? <laughs> uh, so, yeah, there we go. Double kiss. Double kiss. Yeah. Yeah. What can I say, you guys? It's a family affair. And, uh, and uh, yeah, Jeff, you want a glass of wine? Have you, are you going to drink well, back here? While I'm here. Yeah? <laughs> well, that's, that's Trace of Warriors. You may want to get some frog <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, Jeff, you're also an attorney. I yeah, am. Uh, specializing in land use here in Napa yeah. County. Yeah. yeah. And Hal, are you an attorney as well? Soon, Say no, soon, soon no, no. Be. I'm going to be a farmer. <laughs> I'm going to be a farmer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, there you guys go. We have children here. Come on, guys. So go order some and, wine. And, 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 and it looks like we got a proper Memorial Day going on. I, I, it's guys. starting to look. I just it's say this, to look pretty good here. It's, yeah. a, it's a good kickoff. It is yeah. only Saturday, so we got a few days left. But uh, Al is union, so he can only make a, sh a short appearance because uh, <laughs> uh, you know we we'll have to pay extra. Yeah. yeah. So. Uh, so. Let's talk about the Zinfandel really. The frogs in uh, yeah. really quickly, right? Because this is the 17, and I don't know if we've had this on the on the program on the. It seems like we have. It's been a it's been a long virtual. It has series, been a long one. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> I am um, 17 Zinfandel, uh, you know, 17 was a crazy year with heat and all that. And it was, again, like the Cabernet that we've, uh, that we've tasted is uh, definitely from 17. Just uh, uh, an example of how resilient vines can be even during huge heat waves. And this wine is just beautiful and silky. God, I love this vintage. And uh, we, we must be near the end of this, I, I think. Uh, yeah, I think we are. Point, no, so. We're on to the 18 Zinfandel. This is just kind of a way of going back and... Yeah. Tasting, uh, God, can, tasting zin as it develops, and this is starting to get that extra layer, you know, I, just starting to get it. I've loved this wine from the, the minute it hit the barrel, and uh, it, it's been fun uh, to follow it. I mean, I love the 18, it's just coming on, but this, this wine just had extra. You know, uh, we, we had the theme today was picnic wines, and you say, well, what about, Z why was Zinfandel a picnic wine? Well, I'll tell you why it is, is that uh, we are starting to enter the summertime red season for me. Because I drink more red wine, I, I think in the in the summer than I do in the winter time. Because I like to chill them down, not really cold, but just take the heat off from them. You you because, you would need a special employee to, to count the amount of wine that you drink during the summer, though. I mean, yeah. well, that's fair enough, but you know, uh, but, I don't um, I don't know that it could be measured in gallons. You know, <laughs> that's not true. Yeah, hectoliters. A hectoliters. How much yeah. is a hectoliter? Oh, I don't know. Yeah. Those, those are crazy uh, crazy yeah. units. You know. All right. Anyway. Um, but Someone out there knows. Yeah, we talk yeah. about bushels and. and but uh, to me, yeah. if you chill down a bottle of Zinfandel and take it on a picnic, it's the perfect wine because as it sits out and warms up a little bit, if you're doing that with a white wine and you're looking for some ice cubes or some way to get it colder again, whereas a red wine, you know, you start out cold and then during the course of the picnic, it just starts to blossom and get better and better. And, and so ju just as the you know, my favorite thing that is just as the sun starts to go down, it starts yeah. to get a little bit chilly on the in the in the evening. And, it's and just at the right temperature. Then it warms up a little bit, and then all of a sudden you're having your burger, you're having your your roasted veggies, and it's just yeah. the right time for so it. So don't now not all you know not all uh, red wines are chillable. I mean, I don't think I would chill a Barolo, for example. Probably not, but yeah. uh, but. Uh, we're not talking about Barolo today, are right? we? No, we're not. Unless you've got a Barolo that you're holding well, back on. Well, I might later on. <laughs> <laughs> we got, I mean, we got five wines up here. Why not? You know, it's uh, Zinfandel, I think, is ideally, we, we pulled it out for the picnic wine session and for the Memorial Day session just because Zinfandel is that kind of, uh, the way, especially, I think, the way that we make our Zinfandel with the higher acid and a little bit fresher approach to Zin. That's what makes it ideal for eating, uh, for you know, really eating, for drinking with food and including it as a part of your meal. It doesn't have to be this thing that you uh, you pour this much of, take two sips, and uh, and you're out for the night. Um, or it doesn't have to be this heavy kind of ponderous wine. Instead, it's a wine that Zinfandel is all about joy and life and vivacity. Uh, the 17 definitely has it. I think even the 18 just has that yeah, almost yeah. redoubled. It's sassy. Point. Yeah, it's yeah, it's, it's sassy just right now, it's yeah. just super bright. Um, so very much encourage you to drink Zin and, and yeah, put a little bit of chill on it on a, on a, on a warm day. Hey, look, can, can I talk about a pet peeve I have actually, and that's what I believe most of us serve red wines in general too warm. Yeah. We got this idea that red wine should be at room temperature. Throw that idea away. Whoever said that should be... Uh, let's set this in We don't we, we have to call Kelly in here to bail, bail you out <laughs> no, again. Fair right? enough. It should never... Wine, red wine should, should never be at, at room temperature. They should be at cellar temperature. 
the, the temperature that they were aged at and spent most of their life, which is right between 60 and 65 degrees. And most room, thank you, um, most room temperatures, when you think about it, are much warmer, 68, 70, 72, and in the summer, even warmer, 75, 78 is nothing. And so even at restaurants, you see them bringing out their red wines at room temperature, and they're so proud of that, and it's 78 degrees or 75 degrees. That's too warm. They really need to be that 61, 62. So a, a, a shorthand for that is if you don't have a wine fridge where you can, you know, not, a, not everybody has a wine fridge where you can precisely they calibrate don't? the temperature. I know it, it's a sad state of affairs. So sad. Come but, on, these are know, frog fellows. They all have wine. Take, take the wine and put it in the fridge um, and put it in there for no more than a couple of hours. And then make sure you take it out before you pop it and take it out for 20 minutes or so just to let it, you know, shake off the, the refrigerator cold and that's the time to pop it open. It'll taste so fresh and it'll just taste young and, and, and happy. Yeah, and if you overdo it, overdo it to the cold side because it can always warm up. It'll always it, warm up. It, it, to get it to go colder, you have to put an ice cube in it, which I've been known to do, by the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've been known to but do. But I mean... Uh, but that's usually the mark of a wine you don't like, though, is you're like, all right. Hey, and, and, and don't be embarrassed if you're at restaurant and the red wine comes out too warm. Send it back and tell them this is not the right temperature and um, and then you will get thrown out of the restaurant, but uh, that's okay. You but know, you have uh -huh. made a stand. And that's what's important. Cellar temperature is the word to remember there, right? Cold, yeah. cold cellar temp. It, and, and the point you made, Dad, is, is perfect. It can always warm up in the glass. Um, if you're in doubt about, oh, should I decant this? Put it, put it in your glass, let it warm up, let it get some oxygen, and smell it as it goes along. Allow it to develop. And you'll, you never know what you know, kind of secrets the wine will reveal as it warms up and as it opens up. And that's what's kind of fun about wine is that it changes uh, rapidly in the glass often. Especially yeah. older wines, but even younger wines like this will, will, will tend to develop. This wine's already blossoming on me and starting to uh -huh. reveal some of the floral character that I love about I, I, no, Zen. Tell me the 17 Zen, you know, we, we brought it in, it was so warm, it's been so lovely really from the very beginning, so fruit forward, so wonderful. Do you think this is going to age as long as some of like, like the, the 16 or the 18, which are more classical? structured uh, vintages i mean or or, or I, and, and maybe it goes back to this idea that maybe it's arc isn't as long but it'll be just as brilliant i, I don't know what to I, say i think i think it'll have a shorter arc i mean i, I know we're, we're on here to talk about how we love all of our wines and how all of our wines yeah, are yeah. perfect but yeah. they're kind of like children well, they all are perfect, and you have clear yeah. favorites with children you know no i don't wait wait, wait yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah but it, it's yeah. it's uh well i do but he's not sitting here right now this this <laughs> the 17 because of how intense the vintage was i think this wine this really is as infandel to consume uh on the early side and really just just Meaning open. within the next 20 years. <laughs> Meaning within the next 20 years, exactly. I think, uh, you know, this wine is, its primary advantage is that kind of core of really nice, rich fruit that it has. And I, I, I'd stick to the, the 10 to 15 year timeline on this myself. Okay. Whereas I, I think the 16 and the 18, and honestly, I'm adding I'm adding 15 years onto where I'm at right now. Going well, that, who that's, gives a that's shit? like 90 something. Right? Oh, it is not. Uh, <laughs> right, close to it, but not. Yeah, yeah really. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, any uh, brilliant questions here that we have uh, missed? Yeah. yeah. So, what is the myth around cork versus a screw cap? Why do some people believe that better wines have cork bottles? You know, I think that a lot of that is just history. You know. Wines have always been under cork, and so the greatest wines have always I been under cork. I think that's giving cork a short uh, shift. I, I believe that a cork is the perfect s way to seal a bottle that you're going to age for a long time. And, and part of that is that, you know, cork is, if you put it under a microscope, cork is just big, huge cells of cellul uh, cellulose and, and full of air. And when, that, uh, when, the bottle, uh, when the cork goes into the bottle, it has to be compressed from like here down to here to get into the neck of the bottle and that puts the air that's in those cells in the cork under pressure and it releases and pushes some of that oxygen out to the wine so it's part of the evolvement of wine that's not going to happen in a screw cap and 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 it is the perfect way to seal a bottle if you're thinking about aging it for a long time in the case of the rosé and and the sauvignon blanc the problem with the cork is there's a, there's a chance of failure of the, the, the cork is going to give a bad smell to the wine or crumble or whatever. And so for a wine that is not going to be aged for a period of time, I think alternative closures make a lot of sense. Although I will say, Dad, that, that uh, screw cap technology has come a long way since the first, you know, the first screw caps that were introduced you know, 20, 20 years ago uh, really didn't allow any oxygen in whatsoever. They were complete hermetic seals on the wine. Uh, as if you were, you know, trying to seal a jar of peanut butter or something like that, and that's no longer the case. These uh, 
the linings on these screw caps are actually specifically designed to allow very precise amounts, very small amounts, but very controlled amounts of oxygen through so that the wine doesn't get uh, stinky, it doesn't, it doesn't develop poorly. All right, well, I'm an old school screw cap guy, but anyway. Yeah, so, but but, yeah. but it, the, the point of this, it, it is a bit of a stigma. You'll find uh, partisans on, on either side who say, every, all your wines, including your Cabernet, should be in screw cap. And you have partisans on the other side who just go thumb their nose at screw caps and say, well, that's, that's for, uh, that's for uh, cheap wines or that's yeah. for, for simple wines. Well, there's a whole ecological argument to get here, but we may not have time for that this time. It, it, so. goes, it goes pretty deep. Yeah. Uh, another good question on here is, is Zin primarily sourced from Rutherford? It is not. It is primarily soy sourced uh, soy from... Uh, <laughs> you might drink it. Uh, uh, is primarily sourced from St. Helena. It's actually uh, technically a St. Helena Appalachian wine. Yeah, which is exactly... One town north, you know, <laughs> yeah. you know maybe. two miles north of here. <laughs> yeah. So very, very close, but uh, technically a St. Helena Appalachian wine. We just put Napa Valley on the label. Um, we, there is some of the wine, uh, the petite, a large portion of the Petite Syrah that's in this, uh, that's in our Zinfandel, is grown at our Gallarin Ranch in Rutherford and co-fermented with our Zinfandel. Um, but no, it is. Uh, it's about 88% St. Helena Appalachian, and the rest is Rutherford. Um, so that's kind of fun. Can we get a family tree? Oh, I don't know about that. It's a family vine, for goodness sake. Yeah, come on, we don't have trees. You know, <laughs> trees? <on>. Anyway. <laughs> um, what, is, what is the effect been on the popularization of rosé? Do you think that it's a positive that more people are introduced to the wine, or a negative that more people are drinking bad wine? Yes. I, <laughs> I think both of those I, are I, Yeah, I mean, I, yes is the answer, because there, there is a lot of kind of uninspiring rosé out there, a rosé that's trying to catch on to the fad or catch on to the wave. Um, that's a little bit unfortunate, but I think it's very cool that there are some serious barriers being broken with rosé, where rosé is, you know, I'll put it this way, Dad. If I'm grilling some carne asada tacos on Memorial Day, and... Keep going, because it sounds real good to me. <laughs> it sounds really good. Okay, so you've got you've got all these crazy sauces and hot sauce and uh, you know grilled onions yeah. and and there's you know Mexican there's rice on the side and you're going what is going on here What do I pair with this uh, that you know well beer for one thing but if you wanted to pair a wine, rosé. Yeah, that's Let's why rosé starts with a P. Wait, it's for picnic. Right. Yeah. Right. right. Yeah. Well, in Greek it does because the the Greek, the Greek R looks That's like where a I was going with that, yeah. Um, but it's uh, it's the wine that you know it, it's almost it goes with so many different things that it really is the most flexible wine out there. It's you know I, I think people are busting beyond thinking about rosé as just a summertime kind of cheap uh, wine that you drink by the pool. And instead, finding that the wine really does pair with almost everything, and not just in the summertime, but in the wintertime. It's probably the best Thanksgiving wine that you can possibly buy um, because it goes with everything. But pay attention. Make sure it's an intentional rosé. Look at the alcohol content. Ask questions. Look at the color. These are the things that are important. And God, stay away from the sweet rosés. They are they're miserable. Yeah. So, you know, we're going to run out of time, and we won't even get to uh, talk about what we're going to do in two weeks. Two weeks, so we are, <laughs> folks, after 10 weeks of this, we are getting a weekend off. Yeah, uh, next weekend next we will weekend. not be with you. <laughs> but we're going to be back in force the following week uh, talking about Cabernet Sauvignon from bud to bottle. So we are going to get do some deep dives on exactly how Cabernet gets to taste like it does. Uh, we're going to be talking about dry farming. We're going to be talking about some of the specific things that we do with our Cabernet as a kind of example of well of and speaking farming. of deep dive we're deep diving into my cellar right. too because we're tasting my i i believe two, my two, two of your top all-time wines two of my top all-time cabernet sauvignon so we're going to be in, tasting in the, the 08 rutherford uh which for those of you who don't know the rutherford was our reserve wine that we made it's up the in predecessor to our estate yeah. exactly yeah. uh that we made up until 2010 but just a fabulous the 08 is going to be a fabulous wine and the 14 estate cab, which is just oh my god, is completely singing yeah. right now like no other estate cab I think right now. I mean it's just it's, it's just it's, it's, it's in a groove right now. Yeah, yeah. So it'll be a really really cool uh, way of talking about all the principles that go into our farming. So don't forget about us. We'll be back in two weeks. We don't want to lose any of you guys. So we we, we love you guys. Uh, and uh, but we'll be back in two weeks, and then we'll give you guys a week off too to be with your uh, you know. Uh, but uh, we, we assume you have loved ones better than us. Yeah. <laughs> 
Well, we know you do because so many of you have written in, so many of you sent pictures, so many of you have shared with us that this has been a family. That's why we wanted to share a little of our family uh, 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 this weekend, particularly for Memorial Day. Uh, you know, this is our time to remember uh, uh, not only uh, those who've gone before us, and uh, you guys uh, know that's important to me right now, uh, but also a very uh, important time to uh, tip our caps to all the service men and women who have served this country and do not get enough credit. And we want to tip our hats to them too. Please, um, if you've got a, um, a service me uh, member in your, in your family, give them an extra hug for us and pour them a little extra Zinfandel. Um, we love everyone and their sacrifice to this country is, is really important. And, uh, and, and we hope you guys are all safe. Uh, you know, we're starting to see things come alive here. This would normally be one of the busiest weekends of the whole year here at the winery. We're here sitting we're here occupying with, the entire tasting porch. So. With, with Natalie and Jessica, uh, our usual. You guys don't get to see them, but they have been so wonderful. Been with us every uh, week so far, handling all the what's going on behind. And uh, a fabulous tip. Hats off to you guys. You guys get a week off, if nothing else. And um, and let's get back and let's talk about Cabernet in two weeks' time. Yeah. So yeah. Ne the next tasting is going to be uh, going to be pretty intense. We're going to be tasting some pretty sweet wines. Uh, some of the some of the deepest dives we've made into our cellar. So we're very excited to be doing uh, to be doing that, and uh, uh, we're really excited to be talking to you, kind of really in depth about you know why Cabernet is uh, so important to us and uh, and and so yeah. awesome. Hey, we love hearing from you. Remember, John at frogsleep.com. You do not bother me. I love hearing from you guys. And uh, you guys be safe. Have a great weekend. Hats off to all of you. Shouts out to so many friends and family we know who are watching. Alan down in New Zealand. I hope you're still with I mean, we got international follow. Well, Alan. Alan yeah, yeah, we got one international follow. <laughs> it counts. It counts. I said. Alan and I went to Davis together, and he's a renowned vendor down in New Zealand. And uh, we got to cool. get down and see him one of these days. Okay. We've loved being with you guys. Have a great weekend. Uh, and let it warm up. It's time to uh, get off, off with spring and into summer here pretty soon. Yeah. And we'll see you in two weeks. And uh, hats off. Thanks for sharing, and thanks for. Uh, uh, being with our family today. Cheers, guys. Bye now.